Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first session of the 2020 CIDR session series from the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning and the Center for Distance Education Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at Athabasca University. For today's session, we're pleased to have two of our most popular voices and consistent supporters of CIDR, Drs. Michael Barbour and Randy Labonte. You'll know them from their ongoing mini-series of State of the Nation reports on Canadian K-12 online learning. Dr. Michael Barber is Associate Professor of Instructional Design for the College of Education and Health Sciences at Touro University, California in Vallejo, California. He has been involved with K-12 online and blended learning in a variety of countries for two decades as a researcher, teacher, course designer, and administrator. His research focuses on the effective design, delivery, and support of K-12 online learning, particularly for students located in rural jurisdictions. And in recent years, he has advocated for policies designed to promote effective forms of K-12 online and blended learning. Dr. Randy Labonde has more than 30 years of experience as teacher, administrator, and consultant. His doctoral research on leadership in online learning led to his work supporting changes in BC policy, agreements, and e-learning standards. His consulting work has also included distance education support for Alberta rural and remote learners and providers at the secondary and post-secondary level. Randy's publications include papers on quality, standards, and leadership for e-learning. He's an adjunct professor at Vancouver University, Vancouver Island University, where he teaches online courses for K-12 educators, shifting practices to online learning environments. Together, there are K-12 experts for the CIDR sessions. I'm now passing the microphone to Michael and Randy. Everyone, welcome Drs. Michael Barbour and Randy Labonte. Thank you, Dan. Um, Sorry for the pause there. I wanted to make sure I had it before I got started. Um, <clears throat> it's great to be back with uh, the, the CIDR folks. It's uh, always a pleasure to, to be here, and uh, Randy and I always uh, enjoy the sessions that we've got. So today, um, and we're going to go with roughly the same pattern that we've tended to go with in the past. I'll do most of the presenting. Randy will sort of monitor the chat area and um, try to flag me if there's anything that's of particular importance that... Uh, he wants me to address, but otherwise he'll take care of most of that in the chat. And uh, then we'll open it up for questions at the end. So today we're going to be talking about an article that we published in um, the journal that's organized by the Canadian Network for Innovation, um, um, Canadian Network for Innovation and Education, CNIE, uh, entitled A Sense of Irony or Perfect Timing. Um, and the article itself actually um, came about, and, and particularly the title, came about because of a specific sequence of events. So um, for those of you that, that don't know, the American Educational Research Association had its 2019 annual meeting in Toronto last April. Um, and one of the things that... Uh, various units of the Ministry of Education in Ontario were doing was looking through the program and trying to find experts in the field and various topics that they just wanted to come and, and, and talk about uh, their, their areas to them. They wanted to hear essentially a presentation from them. Um, so I got contacted probably in December of 2018 or January of 2019. And basically they just asked me, and it was the research and planning part of the ministry, and they just asked me to come and talk about what does the, the research say about K-12 online and blended learning in general. And um, the nature of the session was basically just open. That was literally all they told me about. Um, now, it starts to get a little bit ironic in that several months later, on the 15th of March, was when the government of Ontario made a large announcement about modernizing um, education in Ontario, and um, basically um, introducing a whole whack of, of measures, of which e-learning was one of them, 
and it set off really a firestorm of, of discussion, both in the popular media and in the social media. And it was quite interesting because, or I say interesting, some would say ironic, because the theme of AERA last year was leveraging educational research in a post-truth era, multimodal narratives to democratize evidence. And when you looked at the call for proposals that they actually had issued earlier that year, um, it actually began, the very first sentence indicated that, you know, one of the issues that they were dealing with in, in this post-truth era um, was the fact that in many cases, facts seem less important to influencing public opinion than emotional appeals or personal belief or misinformation, some might say. Um, the genesis of this article, so this is sort of how it all got started. Now, come July um, is when the deadline for AERA is every single year. And so as I, being an academic and lo living only about an hour from San Francisco, thinking that I wouldn't mind attending and presenting at the next AERA conference, I start looking through the call for proposals, and the theme for the 2020 conference was power and possibilities for the public good when researchers and organizational stakeholders collaborate. And you can see, again, this is in the very first paragraph of that call for proposals. You can see the, the quote of material, and I won't read it to you there, but the genesis essentially is that those that have, uh, you know, a background in scholarship should engage with those who are involved in the practice of some aspect of education so that we can actually have meaningful dialogue and ideally meaningful improvement on the system that is, is happening, uh, which, again, thinking about everything that was happening in Ontario and all of the conversation that was going on, I found this, you know, quite ironic. So Randy and I uh, penned what was a proposal for AERA that a month later in August, we revised for a journal article and submitted it to this particular journal. Um, and so that's sort of how this all came about. Um, and also gives you an idea of both how we approached it and um, some history into the title. So getting into the meat of this. So when I say the, the Ontario government announcement, it's actually not a, a single announcement because as you've looked at the way this issue has progressed, there's been a couple of things that happened. So I mentioned the March 15th announcement when the government came out and said that um, a, a number of things from cell phones to broadband technology um, to workplace um, training, but when it came to e-learning, there were sort of two main points that they proposed or that they announced they were going to do. Uh, the first was they mentioned, or there was a sentence in this announcement, and when I say announcement, you also have to remember that the e-learning portion of this was, I think, six sentences long. So one of the sentences basically said that they were going to centralize the e-learning system. Um, another couple of sentences talked about that they were going to require four courses in order to, four online courses in order to graduate uh, from secondary school. Around the same time, they also engaged in a class size consultation that looked at both the face-to-face -face class size as well as the e-learning class size. And as a part of that class size consultation, they had released a document that indicated that they were proposing to increase the size of an e-learning class to 35 students, um, which was 25% more than what they would have for their face-to-face -face courses, because they were going to cap their face-to-face -face courses at um, 28. Um, and then on the 21st of November, which was after we had submitted the article, so when you actually read through the article, we talk about a four course requirement. Um, the editor was able to slip in a footnote that mentions the uh, drop from four down to two online courses. Um, but uh, because they were already well into the, the copy editing and formatting process at that point, we weren't able to go back and sort of rewrite 
the main part of the article. So at the end of the day, what you have is sort of three parts to these announcements or these items. The fact that they want to centralize the system, the fact that they want to increase e-learning classes to be larger than their face-to-face -face classes, and as well to have 35 students as a maximum. And they want to require students to take two online courses in order to graduate um, from high school. And as Randy notes in the, the chat quite accurately, that a lot of this was coming um, along the... Um, uh, at the same time that uh, the various teacher unions were getting ready to collectively bargain in um, in the province. So um, you can see some of the, the politics that's at play here as well, um, both in these announcements and potentially in the walking back of them. So what we're going to do is actually take a look at all three of these aspects. But the first thing I want to do is spend a little bit of time looking at what does Ontario's current e-learning system look like? Because when you look at what's being put out in the popular and social media, this is probably one of the areas where um, things have been most muddled. Because when you look at a lot of what gets said in those sources, you would swear that the existing Ontario e-learning system is a kid sitting at home by themselves, doing online courses with little to no interaction with a teacher, regardless if that teacher would be in their school or online. There have been some that have nuanced that a bit. Um, so this is sort of the model that you're looking at. You've got an online teacher. You've got a bunch of students that are at home doing it by themselves and may or may not have parents or guardians that are providing support. There are some that have nuanced this a little bit and have talked about having a bunch of kids in a room by themselves um, in front of computers doing this. And as you can see from the pictures there, um, well, maybe two or three of these kids look like they're actually engaged on the computer and maybe in their courses. Um, you can also see from the pictures that it looks like there's a lot of conversation happening amongst them. Uh, in the top picture, it looks like the two students on the left are looking at and um, if the la young lady on the far left is giggling as it looks, um, obviously being entertained by what the student on the right has on their screen. Um, and this is the, 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 the perspective that a lot of folks have said that, you know, this is what online learning looks like in Ontario. And while that may be true in many of the cases that we see, it doesn't have to be the way in which e-learning is structured. In fact, if you look at the literature, it's not what's considered best practice for the way in which e-learning should be structured. So you've got an online teacher, and that's your T there in the middle. And then you've got students at a bunch of different schools that are engaged in that online course. And in theory, they've got you know parents or guardians at home that are providing um, some level of support. And in each of those schools, there is an on-site mentor or facilitator, um, but a local teacher that is required to maintain that in loco parentis responsibilities for those students. Um, another way of looking at it, and this is a slightly older model that was proposed by Nikki Davis um, a little over a decade ago, um, but it's the same idea. You've got, in this case, they call it a virtual school class, but you've got your online class here in white in the middle. You've got students, and you can see the dotted lines for each of the three schools there, students from each of three schools, and at those schools, there's still a teacher that's responsible for them. Um, in the case of the school where the online teacher is located, it seems they've taken responsibility for them. The two schools over on the right of the graph, you see the, the blue person there with an F on them, and they use the term facilitator there. Um, but there is a, for each of these students, essentially, there are two adults that are responsible for them. Uh, one is their online teacher, who is likely geographically distant from the student. And then there should be a school-based teacher that's also responsible for them. I say should because while it is best practice based on the literature, it isn't necessarily a requirement 
that boards in Ontario have to follow. Every single board in the province of Ontario, in order to access the eLearning Ontario content and the eLearning Ontario resources such as the LMS and the SIS and all of the other resources that they've got, is supposed to sign a master agreement. And that master agreement establishes a number of things. It's um, I've just pulled out a couple of the points here from pages 7 to 10. And as you can imagine, if there's four pages of stuff there and I've got you know one slide worth of it, you can only imagine the number of bullet points that I've left out on this. But it goes through and talks about here's what the board is required to do. Here's what the school is required to do. Here's what the principal at that school is required to do. Here's what the technical staff at that school are required to do. And while some might argue that some of the provisions that I've pulled out of these particular four pages imply that there is a responsibility of the school and the school board to provide some level of local support for the students, there isn't anything that specifically states that the board has to provide that local facilitator or that local mentor teacher that we've seen examples of in the literature as being a best practice for this supplemental e-learning environment. Now let's take a look at the um, actual three prongs, if you will, of the proposed changes that are going on. So let's start first with the centralized e-learning system. So as I mentioned, and you can see the link on the bottom to uh, get at this, and Randy will likely type it into the uh, chat because he often does that as he's going along there. Um, but this is the uh, how we describe it, then I say we, Randy and I as authors of the State of the Nation K-12 e-learning in Canada study, describe the system in Ontario. It's in a system that's been in place for 14 years now. And essentially it says that the ministry is going to provide resources, content, and tools in order to engage in online learning. And in addition to that, they're also going to provide um, and they've changed the name from year to year. They used to be uh, dis distance learning, um, teaching contacts, and then they were electronic teaching con or e-learning contacts. Now they're called technology and labeled learning contacts. Um, so they've been called everything from DELCs to ELKs, and TELCs are the current thing. But essentially the ministry has funded a person in each of the boards, and that person's job is to helps uh, teachers and students, but mainly teachers, um, and encourage them to use these tools both as part of their online programs, but also in their face-to-face -face classroom teaching as well. So both for e-learning or online learning, as well as blended learning opportunities. And in order to access all of this, all the board has to do is sign an agreement, sign that master user agreement that I was mentioning a minute ago. And then they have the ability to run their own programs. So essentially what you have happening in Ontario right now is a lot of what is in place with the current e-learning system is already pretty centralized. You know, all of the resources and tools needed to uh, deliver this program are centralized. All of the content is currently centralized. Um, even some of the resources being provided to the board in terms of human resources are provided from the, the, the central ministry. Really, the only decentralized aspect of this now is the actual delivery of the program. So each of the school boards, if they wish to be involved in, in online or e-learning, basically they create a program to determine which courses are offered. They select the teachers to do those courses. They are supposed to make sure that both the district and the schools are undertaking the requirements that are listed in the master user agreement. And in some cases, um, if I remember correctly, the one of the consortiums has about 24 members right now. Another one has um, the public or the Ontario e-learning consortium has, I think it's 24 right now. The Ontario Catholic e-learning consortium has, I think it's about 18, and there's a dozen in the Francophone one, Califlow. Um, but essentially the board may or may not, because some of the boards don't participate in these, um, but the board may get together with other boards to form this consortium so that they can remove some of the overlap or duplication 
that exists within the system. So really what you have is a fairly centralized system that is decentralized at the delivery level because the needs of um, the Ottawa Carleton School Board might be different than the needs of the Thames Valley School Board or um, the Near North School Board. You know, so at the board level, they can decide, you know, what courses are needed, what sorts of additional support beyond what's required in the agreement do we need to provide if there's specific populations of students that aren't being served by the current system, how do we, per, you know, implement a program that's going to be specific to their needs, um, you know, and, and that's something that's going to change from board to board and often I'd say from community to community. Um, so I see, actually, I'll answer this question here. Um, Bill in the uh, chat says, is there a consequence for not signing the master agreement? Um, in theory, it's that you can't use any of the Ontario or the e-learning Ontario resources or uh, content that essentially you'd have to do this all yourself. So you'd have to design all of the course content yourself. Um, you would have to contract for an SIS and an LMS yourself. Um, I think the better question, Bill, is does anyone actually check to see if the school district or the school is maintaining the requirements of the master user agreement? Um, and I don't know the answer to that question. Um, my guess is, based upon just things I've seen on social and popular media about um, the way in which parents and students themselves describe their e-learning experiences, I would say that some of the requirements that are listed in the master user agreement may not be uh, implemented with the level of fidelity that's outlined in the agreement. Whether that's ever reported to anyone um, and what the consequences of that is, I'm not sure because they don't have sort of an, an auditing system that I'm aware of for this. Um, one of the questions that we were commonly asked with respect to this idea of centralization um, was, is, is it more effective? You know, will students learn better in a centralized system compared to a decentralized system? You know, so essentially, is there a pedagogical rationale for this that would benefit students? And when you start to look at the, the Canadian research, and that's what we've tried to focus upon as much as possible in the paper, there really isn't that big a difference. So the province of Newfoundland and Labrador is a good example of this. So initially they had a number of district-based initiatives that were all very decentralized. The ministry had no involvement in it whatsoever. Um, and when we looked at some of the research into that, one of the things we found, and I say we because it was Dennis Mulcahy, uh, faculty member at Memorial University and myself, was that the online students were actually doing a little bit better than the classroom-based students um, in most cases. A couple of subject areas, particularly math and sciences, where they were doing about the same. However, when the province decided to implement a province-wide centralized program, um, we also found that the online students tended to do a little bit better even this past year, where the Newfoundland and Labrador English School District, um, sorry, English Language District, um, basically uh, said that when you look at the completion rates for online courses and students in the same face-to-face -face courses, the online students actually outperformed in terms of completion the the face-to-face -face students. The province of British Columbia is a province that is completely decentralized in terms of its delivery of um, online learning. And when you look at their results, when you had a rapid expansion of the system, initially the online course completion rates dropped. As the system started to adjust, it didn't decrease in terms of numbers, they just essentially got better at what they were doing. The completion rates equaled off so that you had about the same, um, actually for a two to three year period, uh, where you had the online students performing roughly the same as the face-to-face uh, -face students. And then um, after that third year of that sort of equalness, what ends up happening is the online students actually start performing better than the face-to-face -face students as, again, the online system starts to understand the affordances and challenges of its model. 
Um, on the other side of the coin, Nova Scotia, like Newfoundland, is a completely centralized system. And they've reported that their uh, course code, their online pass rates were roughly consistent between their online students and their face-to-face -face students. So when we look at the Canadian research, it doesn't appear that there is really any difference between students that are in a centralized system compared to students in a decentralized system when it comes to student performance. Um, and even when you look at like the existing system in Ontario, which again is, is highly centralized as it is, so it's sort of a, a, a decentralized, centralized system, if you will. Um, you know, in the State of the Nation report back in 2010, Califlow um, indicated that they only had a 4% failure rate that year. Um, in one of the uh, member schools of the Canadian eLearning Network uh, is the Ontario eLearning Consortium, one of the member programs. And in, in conversations and personal communications we've had with them, as well as data that we've asked as part of the State of the Nation over the years, they've consistently reported that they have a 90% plus completion rate. Um, you know, now those are both consortiums and not all distance or not all e-learning programs in Ontario are involved in a consortium. And, and that's a conversation that actually might be worth having at some point is what are the advantages for boards to join these consortiums? And is there any difference between course completion rates in boards that are involved in these consortiums where they're sharing resources um, and trying to get rid of some of the inconsistencies that are involved in the system and sharing professional development and, and best practices compared to the boards that are doing this relatively on their own. So, um, but that's not something that so there's research out there on yet, but it is something that I think would be worth talking about um, and hasn't really been part of the conversation yet. So transitioning over to the e-learning class size and the idea that they wanted to increase it to 35 or 25 percent more than what uh, we have in the face-to-face -face environment. Um, interestingly, there are um, three different uh, union contracts or types of union contracts across the country uh, that do have language in them now with respect to uh, distance learning or, or online learning. Um, several of the local collective agreements that uh, the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation have signed have included language something like what you see there, essentially that the e-learning courses should comply with the maximum class size so that essentially the e-learning class and the face-to-face -face class should have the same class size limit to them. So there shouldn't be this difference between them. Um, in what is, in all honesty, the most developed or most extensive um, collective agreement, at least when it comes to uh, distance learning or e-learning, um, is the Nova Scotia Teachers Union. And in their agreement, um, in the latest version, uh, they indicate that the maximum class size for a distance learning class is 25. Now, that's up from their previous agreement. Um, in their previous agreement, they had actually said it was only 22. And then um, one of the locals, actually, I think it's the Calgary uh, School Board, uh, has as a part of their uh, local collective agreement that essentially what is equivalent to 117 students. The actual language in the collective agreement talks about the number of courses or course enrollments in there. But when you multiply out the course enrollments, it's essentially that a full-time load or a full load for a regular teacher teaching in the online environment is 117 students. Um, so divide that up by the number of sections that you would have. And I know I've got a lot of Ontario people in the audience here, so you would probably do a better job than me of telling me how many courses a teacher would teach throughout the year. Um, but um, so, but that's in the, uh, again, yes, yeah, so that's the Alberta Teacher Association, and it's specific, this particular language is specific to the agreement that the Calgary School Board has, uh, so it's not in the provincial agreement, but in the local agreement that's there. Um, and um, 
uh, if I remember correctly, I'm not sure. If, actually, it's right in the article, so we could look it up afterwards, uh, or Randy can look it up as we're going along exactly what date that particular local agreement is. Um, in the report that we actually did, and we did a separate report looking at class size, um, one of the things that we quoted in there was uh, a paper that a doc student of mine and I uh, authored a number of years ago on behalf of the British Columbia Teachers Federation. And at the time, we were referring to the Nova Scotia Teachers Union and um, what that... Um, what that requirement of 22 meant and why it was limited to 22. And as you can see there, one of the things that we spoke of is when you're teaching in a completely asynchronous environment um, in an online setting, uh, a lot of the cues that you are used to having in the face-to-face -face classroom, you don't have access to. And because you don't have many of these cues, it requires a much more involved and time-consuming interaction with the uh, students in order to figure out uh, where they have, you know, where you've lost them and what it is that you need to help them with. It's also important to point out that um, the research that we have coming out of the U.S. has indicated that when you start to increase the size of an e-learning class, particularly when it increases significantly beyond what you see in your face-to-face -face classrooms, that it has a significantly negative impact upon student performance. Now, most of this research has focused upon the full-time cyber charter schools, the vast majority of which are run by for-profit corporations. So the comparison to the Canadian context um, is limited in, um, its usefulness, uh, but it is worth noting. And um, having a class size that is 25% um, more in the online environment than it is in the face-to-face uh, -face environment, I would characterize as being a, a substantial difference in your class size limits. Um, the key thing to think about, or the key thing to remember when we're talking about the online class sizes, who we are counting as the teacher. Um, so if you are counting just the online teacher as the instructor when you're looking at your student to teacher ratio, uh, which in a face-to-face -face class, that's all you have is just the teacher. So if the ministry, if the government wanted to increase the class size to 28 students per teacher, that means that there would be 28 kids in that room. In the online class, however, if you increased it to 35, assuming they followed the best practices from the literature, those 35 kids would actually be under the supervision of two teachers. Their online teacher, who's geographically separate for, from them, but also that local teacher that's embedded in the school with them. So it, when you're looking at the, when you're talking about the issue of class size in the e-learning setting, it's not as cut and dry as what you'd have in the face-to-face -face setting unless all of those on-site teachers that the literature recommends were not part of the equation. So um, now last but not least in terms of the announcements are the graduation requirement. Um, and in the article uh, again, we were looking at it from the perspective of having to do four courses. Um, so as you read through the article, one of the things to keep in mind is that um, the information that's there uh, is a little bit dated, or you can half, essentially, all of the information that's there. Because um, after we did this, the government walked back their announcement uh, from uh, essentially uh, four to two, but when you look at the number of students that are currently involved, the the People for Education did a, a survey of a bunch of um, schools and had at least schools from every single uh, school board that were uh, participate, but it was something like 12% of the, the schools in the province actually participated, and they said that they felt it was approximately 5% of the students 
that were engaged in one or more online courses. 5%, and this is my calculation, um, based upon when the study was released, was about 31,500 students. In the last published version of the State of the Nation, which is the um, 2018 version, um, and um, the 2019 one hopefully will be released by the end of this month. Um, it's currently with the publisher now. We indicated that there was about 65,000 students that were engaged in online learning in the province, and uh, which, again, by my calculations, works out to about 10%. So if you required every single student in the province to do at least one course, that would mean you would need to scale the system depending upon whose statistics that you're looking at between 10 and 20 times. Um, and if you require two courses, that means you need to increase that by two. Um, in the most recent uh, report that we've got coming out with the State of the Nation, this is the information that the ministry provided. So this is what's going to be in the 2019 report. So they indicated that there were, according to the ministry, about 57,000 students that had taken an online course in the English districts and another 2,500 to 3,000 in the French districts. Um, so that's about 60,000. This past year, there were 628,000 and change secondary students in the province. If we require them to take two courses each at some point um, in their grad, you know, in their high school career, that means we're going to need to take essentially um, one, just over 1.2 million course enrollments that are going to be needed to meet the mandate. If they have four years to take those two courses, that essentially means that we're going to need to enroll about 314,000 students a year, every single year, in an online course. Now, I don't know if you've sort of thought about the, the math that's involved here, but um, if you think about what's required in order to provide that, I know there's been a lot of talk about connectivity, and we do talk about that in the article. Um, one of the things that we do say about it is that uh, there is a real tension between you know, do you need the access first before you can implement a particular project, or do projects like this drive the kind of access to technology that's required? And if you look at just the changes that have happened between the government's announcement on March 15th, which said that the broadband would be provided to all schools by the second year of this project, compared to their announcement on the 21st of November, where they said it would be provided prior to the start of the first year, of this requirement, um, at least based upon what they're saying, um, and that's really all we can talk about now because we're uh, we have no evidence of of action or inaction on their part. Um, it appears that the announcement is driving uh, the access to the resources, but forgetting the connectivity for a minute. Not that it's a small issue, but it's one that we talk about in the report. Think about the physical space that would be needed to have 314,000 students throughout the province involved in e-learning. If you assume that your school is organized on some sort of five-by-something timetable, so there's five one-hour classes a day. If you assume that they put the maximum number of students based upon their initial consultation into each of these classes at 35, there would still be a need for, I think it works out to 1,786 different rooms in the province that were basically rooms with 35 computers in them for these students and nothing else. And that these 1,800 rooms would be occupied every single period of the day to capacity every day of the week. You know, just the physical requirements for that in the school. I mean, I don't know off the top of my head how many schools, high schools there are in the province of Ontario, but you've got to figure that's at least one room per school. That is nothing but a distance ed room 100% of the time. In some schools, I'm sure that means that that's four or five or even six classrooms. That's nothing but a distance ed room 100% of the time. Um, similarly, 
when you look at just the comparison between the number of teachers that currently teach in those classes, again, if you assume that every single current course is being taught by, or each teacher is just teaching one course online, you're going to need four times the number of online teachers every single year than what you currently have. Now, at present, we really don't know what they plan on doing in terms of the supervision or the in loco parentis role for these 1,800 rooms that have 35 kids in them five periods a day. But if we assume that the best practices from the literature are implemented and that you have a certified teacher that's in the room helping to facilitate the online learning that's happening during the day. Even if they increased both the face-to-face -face classes to 28 and the online classes to 35, they would still need another 4,486 teachers than the current system has in order to implement this particular agreement. Now, again, that's assuming that they follow what is best practice based on the literature. And if, so essentially, if there's no local teacher, so if they only have an online teacher and there's no teacher at the student's school responsible for them, and if they go through with the online classes are one more or are 25 percent more than the face-to-face -face classes, it actually means a reduction of about 1,500 teachers. And then there's the issue that all of the teachers have to be trained as well. Um, you know, so these are big scalability issues. Um, and then we've got a red herring that we've got that's been a large part of the conversation. Um, and essentially it's that, you know, there are certain types of students that just can't learn online. And as much as people will talk about that, it is just that. It is a red herring. It's designed to distract. So the current system, as it's been developed, has been developed in such a way to cater to specific populations of students. And in most of the school boards, when you look at the history from, you know, when these programs first started being developed in 1995 to the present, typically speaking, they've been developed for students that are more academically inclined or students that just have a, a specific intrinsic interest in a specific course. In both those cases, those students are going to probably have more self-motivation, self-regulation, self-independence, you know, self-efficacy, those kinds of things. And that's one of the reasons why when you look at the completion rates that we have between courses that are offered during the September to June part of the year and courses that are offered during the summer school, the summer school course completions and pass rates are actually quite poor. And it doesn't surprise me that it's quite poor because they're using a design, a delivery, and a support system that's designed for a type of student that doesn't take summer school. Um, you know, so one of the things to keep in mind is that if I were to teach in a face-to-face -face classroom where I'm only teaching students that are more academically inclined, that are seeking a more challenging course, or that have a greater intrinsic interest in the course, and that's the only way I taught my face-to-face -face classroom, those students would have success and everyone else would fail or everyone else would be challenged. And with an optional system, I, I won't say that's okay, because I still think that's a travesty that that's happening, but it's at least understandable as to why it's happening. You know, I'm going to teach my AP physics course very differently than I'm going to teach a credit recovery course in math, as an example, regardless if it's online or face-to-face. -face. Um, there's a wonderful metaphor in the field of educational technology that basically says that technology influences learning the same way that the delivery truck impacts the nutritional value of the groceries that it carries. In both cases, regardless if it's the technology used in the classroom or the delivery truck with respect to the groceries, it is a delivery medium. And what impacts learning is the um, way in which the learning is designed, delivered, and supported. And when you design, deliver, and support a particular program with the student's specific needs in mind, that student is likely going to have success. Um, and let's just keep in mind the, the simple fact that what you often have in the online environment, as well as the face-to-face -face environment, 
you know, there are holes in the system. I mean, people talk about the face-to-face -face instruction, classroom-based learning, like every single student is succeeding in that environment. And the reality is, is that they aren't. There are a lot of students that are being let down by the current system for a variety of reasons. Um, so, you know, face-to-face -face isn't necessarily the holy grail in much the same way that uh, online or e-learning isn't the, the, the demon or devil that it's being portrayed. Both mediums have certain um, affordances that it allows them to do things better than other mediums. There are also certain challenges with each medium. And what really um, makes the difference is essentially, again, how programs are designed, delivered, and supported. And the support is the key thing because in, this is a, a theoretical conceptual model that uh, Jared Borup and some of his colleagues have come up with. But essentially what you have is, you know, the student has a certain amount of internal ability or internal support. Uh, that's the black there. They have support outside of school from their own personal communities and network. That's the red there. The goal of any educational program, regardless if it's face-to-face -face or online, is that yellow part there or yellowish part there needs to make up for the difference. And if you have a situation like this, the student is not likely going to have success because as you can see their, you know, their level of engagement on different areas isn't that high. And so they're going to be challenged in this. So certain students will need to have their e-learning delivered, designed, and supported in different ways than other students, in much the same way that uh, certain students need their classroom learning designed, delivered, and supported in different ways in order to have success. Um, I do want to touch quickly on, because it's starting to become more and more part of the conversation, the states in the U.S. that have these online learning requirements. And here are the five that um, do right now. And four of them have been specifically referenced by the minister. And it's important to actually look at what this means for each of these students. So when you look at what is actually required by each of these states, and I've ordered them in the order, not that they were... Um, introduced in each of the state, but in the order in which they were first mentioned, either in the popular or social media, in particular by the government themselves. So the first one they mentioned was Michigan, second Alabama, the third Florida, and the fourth Arkansas. And when you look at it, do they require a full online course? Well, three of the four jurisdictions as part of their graduation requirement require a full course. Michigan is the only one that doesn't. Um, they require 20 hours of online learning. Does a blended course count towards meeting the graduation requirement? Again, in three of the four, it does. Florida is the only one that it doesn't. Um, is there exemption for students that have IEPs if applied for? The only one that specifically mentions it is Alberta or um, Alabama, sorry, um, in terms of being on the positive side. Florida mentions it specifically saying that all students must know exemptions. There is no language in the actual legislation in Michigan or Arkansas that speaks to it one way or the other. Um, looking at this issue as a whole, and I think this is, it hasn't been part of the conversation, but for me, this is the crux of the conversation. Why is the government doing this? And if you look at what they said in their March 15th announcement, Essentially, they were talking about modernizing the classroom for being, you know, having it done in innovative ways. And so students would get skills and be able to use technology so that they would be prepared for the workforce that they were going to enter. And that's a wonderful goal. The question that I would have is, is e-learning the way in which this should be done? Or is e-learning an effective way that would actually accomplish these goals? Unfortunately, we don't have much research out there on it. Really, the only research that we've got is this one study done by um, Dale Kirby and Dennis Sharp. I was a little bit involved, just wrote the lit review for them, but I wasn't involved with the study. You can see the purpose of the study there, uh, but more importantly, it's the results that I think are interesting. Um, essentially, when it comes to uh, learning at a distance in university, students that had experience learning online in high school had no differences in their perceptions, attitudes, and habits 
when it can compared to students that didn't have that experience. So at least in this particular study, taking an online course didn't achieve the goals that the ministry is hoping to achieve. Um, for those of you, and I wanted to put this in there so that it would at least be in the slides, this is the actual article that was written. And I'm a little bit longer than I thought because I forgot to account for Dan's introduction up the front. Um, so the six minutes that I'm past where I want it to be um, was because I didn't account for Dan's six-minute introduction. So um, I'll open the floor up to questions now, and I think Dan will move from uh, single mic mode at this point. Sure, great, yes, and thank you, uh, Michael Barber and Randy Levante. Uh, we are open for questions. So if anyone has a question, you can grab the microphone. It's in the top bar. I'll click it once to turn it on. Click it again to turn it off. And remember to keep it turned off when you're not speaking to avoid any echoes or feedback. And thank you. I'll jump uh, in at this point. Kind of, sorry. The, the, oh. the ATA line, um, one was one that brought forward. Is there anyone from here from Alberta K-12 that can answer that question around uh, the, the numbers? Um, courses or student load for uh, K-12 that came out of the ATA statement. And while we're waiting for anyone to jump in, I've just posted the exact language that was in the uh, letter of understanding that the Alberta Teachers Association had with the, uh, on behalf of the Calgary Board um, eLearn teachers. And I'm thinking that, that that's a discussion that if you are interested, if you want to type in your email address that uh, Michael can take with you, to take up with you offline independent of this, I think that was a sidebar of just one stat that was on one slide. Um, there was some interesting conversation back and forth. I did um, respond to a few of the questions, but are there other questions or areas to focus on that have not been covered uh, either in the text or on slide? Thank you, Frank, for uh, adding that clarification to the text. Feel free to grab the mic to speak. You'd probably get more attention, uh, and everyone is, seems to be texting. Hi, Randy. It's Bill here at uh, Nate in Edmonton. Just curious, what what do you and Michael think is the real impetus behind the uh, Ontario announcements? Was it a financial decision, a student success decision? Uh, decision? Was it politically motivated? Um, what what sort of got this going and um, sort of started this whole announcement process? I, I, I'm going to jump in on that one, Bill, because uh, that that's the interesting part, and because none of the details about how the plan is to be implemented, uh, have been released, uh, and nothing concrete that can be looked at. It becomes very speculative about what the motivations are, and that's what's carried the narrative in the sort of the media and the social media contexts. Uh, and that necessarily has done a, a disservice, I think, to some of the e-teachers and those that have been actively working in e-learning programs, so that they're being tarred as well as the e-learning delivery that has been successful in the province has been tarred as ineffective. And it's it's sort of a little bit divisive in with the, the teachers groups. And I don't think that that's an accurate representation. So we have avoided any speculation. We've only dealt with what has been published. And as you can see in the, the narrative in the slides, uh, done some math calculations uh, about this. But until the details are released, uh, it'll be problematic at best to try to guess what uh, is happening, and that discussion is really one that should be directed towards what is occurring at the bargaining table between teachers and the government who have brought this issue to that uh, particular discussion. I'll jump in as well because we've seen it really, like as an example, in the past two weeks there has been that secret document that came up 
um, which indicated that the government was in going to change the regulations around high school delivery to allow students to complete their entire Ontario Secondary School diploma online. I don't know if there's something in the legislation or regulations now that prevents that, but that one line was seen by a lot of people and by not just sort of, you know, the folks ranting on, on social media, but journalists as well that have put forward the notion that this means that the government wants all students in Ontario or wants a lot of students or wants any number of students in Ontario to do their high school completely online. And, you know, that's a big jump from saying that you've got some student up in, up in the north in some rural area that's being bullied significantly in their school and because they live in a small rural area don't have the ability to just go to the school that's you know five or six blocks away kind of thing they if they want to go to school at all they have to go to that school and they have to be subjected to that bullying every single day and the ministry wants to change the regulations to allow that kid to be able to do all of their schooling online so they can remove themselves from that situation that's a very different narrative than saying you know that we want, you know, that the, the government wants to uh, allow corporations to come in and run online schools and force all of the students to take online learning full time and that we're going to privatize the complete system. But that's sort of the, the latter there is, is a lot of the conversation that we're hearing. We're not hearing the other side and in the reality we have really no concept of what the government was thinking when they uh, had that particular item in there because they're not providing any of the details around how this is actually going to be implemented. Uh, Michael, you want to flip to the slide with our contact information, or I'll put it, uh, that's yours as well. I'll type in my email address in the text here. Where you, just go ahead, Stephen. Hi. I just had a, a quick question. We never really talked about the difference between, say, uh, an on, well, I think you alluded to a little bit in terms of the structure around uh, some of the formats in the schools where there would be a student who would have a, a blended circumstance, like a blended uh, learning uh, experience where there seems to be a partnership between a local school and then an outside partnership. But what I'm concerned, my question relates to the the outside school source, and and I guess as some of you know, uh, the Alberta Distance Learning Center or ADLC, um, you know we're certainly a distance education provider and we have online courses, and our courses are uh, built in a in a different, like they're built quite heavily. Um, and it seems like our partners really uh, like those types of courses to be built that way. And some of the other online schools in Alberta have uh, more of a more of a daily, if not weekly, kind of teacher presence course development on the way. I know that that some of that might might be a bit of a stretch, but I'm just wondering about the difference in the Ontario example you provided. Is there talk, or was there? any talk about a central source that would be providing some of the course materials to either the teachers or the schools in, in support of the students in their education. Does that make sense, that question? Is there a central source for that or will it be online schools specifically in Ontario? Well, actually, Steve, it's, it's, it's an interesting question and when you look at the current model, essentially to, I guess, provide a, an Ontario context for it, if you can imagine like the ADLC was sitting in the ministry right now so that you are providing a learning management system and you're providing all that course content that you're creating and that each of the districts throughout the province of Alberta, and I know some of them do it like this now, they're essentially managing their own program and they're using your content and your tools in order to run their program. That's the way in what, that the current system is done in, um, in Ontario. So there's no 
or at least that's the way the e-learning unit does. And I have to say it that way because um, there is the independent learning center, which is, a, you know, that's run by TV Ontario um, that essentially offers correspondence like courses. They're self-directed. Um, and while very few of them are print only anymore, like a traditional correspondence course, um, they are designed to be sort of, for the most part, teacherless courses that have a um, that uh, have a tutor or a grader attached to them, not necessarily a teacher. Um, but the the e-learning system that's there, that's run by the e-learning unit, would be similar to what you have with many of your partner school districts in Alberta if the ADLC was sitting inside of the Ministry of Education. Um, I see a question from Bill there about the First Nations programs like Kiwetanik um, that exist in Ontario. Um, these programs are schools that um, have ministry identification codes, um, so they get funded uh, at the same way that every other school in the province gets funded. So they are funded through their enrollment. Um, because they are part of a First Nation, um, they do also receive some funding through um, from their band councils, because if you look at the way in which the um, Indigenous Services Canada currently funds education across the country, um, they basically provide it to the local band, the funding and resources to the local band councils, and then it's up to the local band councils to determine the types of educational programming that it wants to support. Um, in the case of uh, the, the Kiwetanik program, I know that it's it is supported quite strongly by the, the, the band councils up there. Um, so it's in their case, it's a, a little bit different. Um, because it is a, a school that does have an Ontario Ministry Identification Code, they would be held to the same standards for achieving an Ontario Secondary School Diploma as what other Ontario schools would. Um, so if there is a mandate for required online learning, if that actually comes to pass, um, it would be required for a school like Kiwetanik as well. I know that Dan probably wants to stop the recording, so and we're four minutes past the hour. Um, what I'll do is I'll let Dan formally close the session so that he can stop the recording, but. Uh, Randy and I are both available to hang out here if folks have additional questions after that. Um, so that way Dan can get things moving on his end, but we're happy to hang out and continue to chat as long as folks uh, have queries. Sure. Uh, yes, it's been a great conversation. Um, and thank you to our presenters, Michael Barber and Randy Labonte, on a very... Um, Interesting topic. Thank you for going through the math with us. It'll be uh, interesting to see how it all plays out. Uh, the slides that you've been seeing on the screen are available at cider.athabascau.ca, and a full recording will be posted in about an hour uh, at the CIDR site as well. So thank you once again. And yes, we will hang out as long as uh, necessary um, to go through any questions that you may have or any further discussion.